Hey guys, welcome to the show. We're gonna kick things off at the one and only Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio, with a special focus on Jim Morrison and the Doors. Let's check it out. We're here in Cleveland, Ohio, at the one and only Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and we're delighted today to have the curator of the Hall of Fame, Jim Henke, with us. Jim, welcome to Guitar Shop TV. Delighted Thank you. to have you with us. My pleasure. Thank Jim, you. this is such a treat today. We're standing in front of the iconic Jim Morrison uh, exhibition. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, this is a uh, an exhibit. It's a very interesting exhibit. It's a lot of things. That basically, all these items came from Jim's parents, and it's. Um, really incredible collection because they had saved like every document related to Jim's career and it, well, to his life basically. It has his birth certificate, uh, these notes that he wrote as a little kid to his parents, his Cub Scout uniform, report cards, all kinds of things like that. There's basically this break in the collection and it sort of ends when he graduates from uh, UCLA and then it picks up again with a document that I wanted to talk about and it's actually a um, letter that Jim's father wrote in, back in 1969 to a uh, probation officer in Miami, Florida. In March of 1969, Jim and the Doors were playing a concert in uh, Miami and at one point, I guess he was very, very drunk, and at one point he asked the audience if they wanted to see his penis. According to the people there, he allegedly then pulled it out and then simulated masturbating and then put it back in and um, he was subsequently charged with uh, lewd and lascivious behavior and public drunkenness. The case went to trial and he was found guilty. And then what happened is he um, ended up um, basically uh, appealing the conviction. And, um, and then he went, ran off to Paris. And before it went back to trial, he ended up um, dying. It was sort of one of the last events of his um, lifetime. But what's, what the int what's interesting is this letter that we have here, it's actually in response to this letter. And this letter is from the uh, probation officer down in Florida. The probation officer wanted to know about, he was, A, he was saying he was a little bit concerned about Jim's mental state and all that, and he wanted to know what interactions his father had had with him. So his father wrote this response um, in October of uh, 19, 1970, actually. This is when it was going back to trial. It's a very sad letter, because what he says is that he hasn't seen his son in about five years, and that, um, and he points out that Jim was always an excellent student, which, again, all of the report cards and everything we have uh, bear up to that. He pretty much got straight A's and all that. He went and was studying film at uh, UCLA, and then that's when he, while he was at UCLA is where he met the other guys and they formed the doors. And what his father says in this letter is that he had basically told his son that he um, didn't like the idea of him being in a rock band and that he had had this great education and he should really use his education and get a real job and all that. And uh, when Jim graduated from college, um, his, his parents were living in England at the time. They invited him to come over and Jim didn't go. And um, then, then the doors took off and the rest is sort of history, but it's a very sad letter about a father who's fallen out of contact with his son. You know, and this is just so timely, just given the recent pardon. Right, that's, yeah, exa yeah exactly. Back in this past December, the state of Florida actually pardoned Jim and uh, dropped the charges. Now that was cool. Jim Morrison was just amazing. Okay, from here we're heading uptown to the Iridium nightclub here in Manhattan. And we got a special interview and performance coming your way from Robbie Krieger, the former lead guitarist of The Doors. Let's check it out. The Doors were founded in 1965 in Los Angeles by vocalist Jim Morrison and keyboardist Ray Manzarek. Together with guitarist Robbie Krieger and drummer John Densmore, they forged a truly unique sound, combining Morrison's unforgettable vocals and lyrical images with the band's hard-driving rock, blues, and fusion rhythms. The Doors went on to become one of the most controversial and influential rock acts of the 60s, and Morrison's early death in Paris in 1971 only served to enhance the band's iconic status, which it has now enjoyed for over 40 years. And, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we loved uh, Miles Davis and, and Coltrane and all those type of uh, players. Uh, you know, we were all pretty much into jazz. And um, we, uh, you know, we wanted to be something a little different than most bands and we couldn't help but be because of our influences you know and, you know I, the doors we considered ourselves kind of jazz uh jazz rock really because it was like three three musicians and, and a poet and uh we all kind of played off each other um and uh there was a lot of improvisation you know so uh, we were the first uh, 
Jazz Fusion Group. You know, the SG was my first electric guitar, and uh, you know, the reason I bought it was because I went and saw Chuck Berry play one day. <laughs> and I said, hey, you got a red guitar, I'm going to get one like that. I didn't realize it was a 335. <laughs> but so I went to the pawn shop and I said, hey, there's one. And it was an SG, so I bought it. And it was the cheapest one in the store, too. So, uh, and ever, ever since then, I've always loved that guitar because, you know, it's got so many frets. For one thing, it's got the double cutaway. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's light. You know, Les Pauls were too heavy for me. They they felt sluggish, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, for me, it's the perfect guitar. You know, for a long time I didn't play SGs. When I was playing fusion, I started playing uh, 355s uh, when I was do, uh, doing my solo albums. But then, uh, about ten years ago, my uh, my friend uh, and road manager at the time, Marco Moyer. He, he always wanted me to play SGs, you know, oh, you, it doesn't look right for you to play a 335, you know, you got to get an SG. So I said, no, I don't want to play those anymore. And then, so finally he picked one up, a, a 67 from this uh, a music shop that he found, and he brought it over and he said, hey, just try this, you know. And I said, wow, this is great, you know. <laughs> and ever since I've been playing that guitar. Again. Cool. So, and then Gibson finally came out with my SG and it, it's an yeah. exact copy of that guitar that we bought back in, uh, it was, it's a 67. Did you put any other features into it or you well, just kept it's it got, as a... Well, the neck is actually from a, from a Les Paul Jr. Oh, okay. And it's got special wiring where the, uh, you can put the pickups out of phase with a pulse push switch and get that Peace Frog sound.
Wow, totally cool. Thanks, Robbie, for sharing your thoughts with us. Okay, guys, that's it for now. We'll see you next time. Make sure you check us out on guitarshoptv.com or find us on Facebook. We got something new going on every day. See you soon. <laughs>